There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, a boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, chromium, lithium, beryllium, and barium. As I mentioned in the last video, there's different types of chemists, different roles of chemists, and different branches of chemistry. So for example, we had the analytic chemist, who was all to do about with analyzing samples. So he tried to figure out the composition of samples, whatever he was looking at, or he or she was looking at. We've got the chemical engineer, who was des was designing new type of technology to be used by chemists. We had the developmental chemist, who was going to make new procedures for industry. So for example, he would come up with safe and efficient ways of producing, let's say, iron ore. We had the production chemist, who supervised the procedures, to supervise the production. He was making sure that the production of, for example, iron would go ahead as planned. If there are any problems, he would probably alert the developmental chemist. And there was a research chemist. He was the one who came up with new ideas and new products. And so new ideas plus products. So for example, a making a new drug, he would come up with a new drug if he were, a, for example, working for the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies. Now these are the roles of chemists and there are also different types of branches. So for example, we've got the environmental chemistry branch. So these are ones who were, would usually analyze samples within the environment, would check the environment to make sure everything is running smoothly, would um, sort of find out exactly how the environment works. We've got biochemistry. These are the ones who deal with living things and how biology and chemistry sort of make everything happen. Biochemistry is a very interesting area. We've got forensic chemistry. These are the ones who would, for example, deal with crime and would figure out using chemistry, would figure out if someone committed a murder or not, or a crime. Organic chemistry, these are um, chemists who deal with carbon compounds. And in organic chemistry, these are chemists who would deal with non-carbon compounds. So, for example, you different types of uh, metals are all inorganic. So we have different types of branches and we have different types of roles. So you can imagine that we would have to have some sort of exchange of information and communication between different types of scientists to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Because there's so many different types of chemists and so many different types of branches of chemistry that one person can't possibly do everything. There needs to be some sort of collaboration, some sort of teamwork between the chemists. And that's exactly what happens. And the reason why I mention all this is because the dot point itself says identify. So just Identify in this case means name. Name the need for collaboration between chemists as they collect and analyze data. All right, so that's just what we have to talk about. And I've just got a couple examples here. So for example, let's say we have this coal power plant here. This is a coal power plant. And this coal power plant has to do two things. It has to come up with a procedure. All right, so it has to come up with some procedure to make power from coal and it also has to be able to make sure that this procedure runs smoothly so it has to, it has to sort of monitor this procedure and as you can see there's something coming out gas coming outside of this chimney and often you're going to have stuff different types of chemicals going inside the river as well so they need to be able to sort of check the environment as well they have to check the environment to make sure everything is running smoothly so there's no pollution that shouldn't, shouldn't be there. Right? So all of these are parts of a coal power plant, just part responsibilities of a coal power plant. Now, a production, uh, sort of a developmental chemist, he's the chemist who would be employed by the coal power plant to come up with this procedure. So how, you know, how much coal do we need? Could we use some sort of enzyme to speed up the reaction? Um, how much water do we need? What happens if there's a problem? All this would be done by the developmental chemist. He would come up with this procedure. So this is the job of the developmental chemist. Now, once this is in place, or once the procedure is in place, then we need to have another chemist who makes sure we can monitor this whole thing. And if there's a problem, then he would notify the developmental chemist, for example. So the monitoring chemist, he's the product, production chemist. So the production chemist supervises the production of power, in this case from coal. Now they have to talk, so they have to communicate. And the reason why is if, for example, the production chemist sees that there's a problem with the, the plan or, or it gives them advice in general, then he would have to tell this information to the developmental chemist who would come up with a refinement of the procedure. And there, the developmental chemist as well has to 
talk to the production chemist because he has to let them know of the plan, you know, what, what was actually, what is this procedure and what are the ins and outs of this procedure because the production chemist will have to actually control that procedure. So they have to be communicating on a constant, on a consistent basis to make sure everything's working smoothly. And then we also have the environmental chemist who, for example, could be employed by the Environmental Protection Agency. And what he does is he checks the environment, right? So he'll, he'll look at the samples from the atmosphere. He'll look at the samples from the river to see if there's any pollution. And if there's any problem, or even if there's no problem, the environmental chemist will generally talk to either the production or the developmental chemist or both of them, right? Letting them know that there's a problem or that there's no problem. So if there's no problem, then the developmental chemist won't have to do anything. But if there's a problem, too much pollution, then the developmental chemist has to refine his procedure to make sure that there's pollution. Right. So that's a, there's an example of collaboration between chemists. They all have to talk to each other to make sure everything runs smoothly because one chemist doesn't have the expertise to do everything in, in all the different areas. Another example would be the making of a new drug. Right. So you have to, if you make a new drug, first thing you have to do is you have to research the drug. So once you once you kind of know what you want to do, you need to figure out how you can actually do that. And that's the research part. Once you've researched it, once you've found out the chemistry behind how you can do it, what you need to do next is you need to be, make a procedure. Again, you need to be able to produce that drug on a larger scale. So this procedure needs to be in place. And once this procedure is in place, you need to be able to produce it on mass scale. So then the production, after procedure is in place, the production will happen. And this is where we will actually be able to produce it on a massive scale. So first, we have the research chemist, whose job it is to come up with the research, right? So he's the one who's going to research a new drug. That's his job. The developmental chemist, as I mentioned earlier, he's the one who they usually comes up with a new procedure. So he is going to come up with a new procedure. And obviously, if you have the drug being researched by the research chemist, he needs to be able to communicate with the developmental chemist, because he needs to tell him the ins and outs of this new drug, and how he thinks it can be produced, right? So it has to be communication between the two. And if there's any problem, like for example, if it if it doesn't work, if his this new idea can't be done on a massive scale, then the developmental chemist has to can communicate with the research chemist and tell them of the problem. Right? So it has to be a two-way kind of traffic in terms of communication. But then we also have the production chemist, right? The production chemist is the one who overlooks the production of a drug. So once we have this procedure in place. Of we know we know the steps we have to do to make it. The production chemist needs to make sure the production happens on a large scale and happens smoothly. Right? So if there's any problem, then the production chemist will have to communicate with the developmental chemist to make sure that the developmental chemist knows that the procedure is a bit flawed. And same thing in general, the other way as well, the developmental chemist generally needs to tell the production chemist exactly how to, um, you know, what to look for when it comes to the production of this drug. So here you can see again how we have this collaboration between different types of scientists, and this happens on a, on a, usually on a massive scale. And these are just a couple of examples, but we'll have there are more. But um, generally, a chemist doesn't work alone. A chemist works in a team, and there are different types of chemists who are specialized in different types of areas, and they all come together to make a new product or a new idea become reality. But I hope that was useful. So that's why for this one, identify the need for collaboration between chemists as they collect and analyze data. Right? So here they're collecting and analyzing data. Analyzing would be, for example, to see if this new drug is this new drug development part is working. Right? They're looking at data, they're analyzing the data to see if it's working. And then once they're whilst they're analyzing data, they're always talking to each other, making sure everything works smoothly. I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.